The Antifada is more than a podcast. It's a specter haunting the globe. It is the synthesis of the two most frightening things for the cheerleaders of this reactionary hell world. One ravaged by the unbounded savagery of capital and its states. Antifa super soldiers and intifada. Bash the bash in a global uprising. Be prepared to enter the Antifada mindset. I'm Jamie Peck. I'm Sean KD. And we're here with our friend, writer and historian, Ross Wolf. And we are recording live to tape from Leftist Best Headquarters, about a half an hour walk away from the gentrification-ravaged Gowanus Canal, in the coastal elite bubble of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Hell yeah. How's everybody doing tonight? We're feeling good? A little tired, but uh, not, not the worst I've ever felt. Ross? No complaints. I could complain because it's uh, we're recording at about seven p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time on a uh, Wednesday, and I've been up for fifteen hours. This is me recording on a work day, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, <laughs> same, I'm also recording on a work day. All right, so we're gonna try our hardest to not be tired. We're gonna pretend mm-hmm. we're not tired by drinking yeah. beer, which always wakes you right up. Yep. Um, so we're very happy to have Ross on the show today. Um, there was a, uh, Ross, it was probably, I'd say, maybe, what, four or five weeks ago that uh, we went to the Verso Loft party? Uh, I think it was the uh, the Valentine's Day. Oh, shit. So, yeah, we're talking, damn, time flies. The Valentine's Day uh, party. Um, yeah, I'm, I forget what the theme of it was, something about love and revenge. But it was <laughs> it was pretty big. There were lots of people. Yeah, it was a good little party. I do recall Jamie Peck beating an effigy of uh, Donald Trump with a broom handle. I did do that. It was very satisfying. I like how you swung so hard that uh, our friend Jake, who who runs the Verso space, like looks up from his phone for a second and almost sees himself get hit. And he's like, <laughs> holy shit! And he jumps back. Yeah, I mean, you I had a blindfold on. <laughs> There's a really good video, actually. Somebody took it. A, a good comrade took it and uh, came up to me after, and he said, hey, do you want this video? And I was like, hell yeah. So he texted it to me, and I put it up on my Instagram, and you can very clearly see the moment where Jake realizes <laughs> that uh, you can, you can kind of see his life flash before his eyes. And even though you're blindfolded, you can see the hate radiating through yep. the blindfold. Oh, mm-hmm. oh, which reminds me, how pure is your hate today, babe? On a scale of one to hate, how pure is it? I'd give it like 10 reindeer in the uh, cold driven pure snow of hate. Wow. That's that's pretty good. How about how about our guest? I mean, maybe it's just autism, but I mean my mood tends to be pretty even keel. Goes from maybe mild annoyance to mild excitement. Hey, that's that's pretty good. I'm kind of uh kind of a little jealous of that. Yeah. Uh, do you know where the how pure is your hate thing came from? Oh, well, it's uh Cockburn, right? Coburn, yeah. Coburn. Many people pronounce it Cockburn, which is <laughs> sounds painful. But uh, yeah, Alexander Coburn. It's it's a great story actually. Uh, when we have Doug on, he could tell it even better. But basically, uh, Alexander Coburn, when he worked at the Nation magazine, used to ask every single one of his interns um, when they first started. He'd say to them, "How pure is your hate?" You know, and he'd get various responses from it. But it was basically his way of you know testing their metal. Um, a guy by the name of Ed Miliband. Uh, mm. son of famous Marxist uh, Ralph Miliband and uh, former labor leader. Uh, Ed Miliband came to intern with him. And Alex Coburn, as always, asked Ed Miliband, how pure is your hate? And uh, we can tell how far he'd fallen from his father, how far the apple had fallen from the tree, because Ed Miliband was like, hate? Oh, I, I don't hate anybody. I, I'm full of love. <laughs> <laughs> boo. boo boo this man try again <laughs> so I, I think that's going to be a running thing now we have to ask every guest uh, how pure their yep. hate is yeah and if you want to know how pure mine is it's uh about as pure as ever which is to say very that's wonderful speaking of hate and the verso books party uh i noticed you got into a little dust up with somebody who is this you you're referring I, to i noticed you babe oh me yeah ah. i i remember i remember you coming up to me and saying uh there's a nazi here and i <laughs> told him he has to there's an alt-right dude here and i told him he has 15 minutes to leave and if he doesn't leave i'm gonna kick his ass yeah. that 
that that may or may not happen may or may not have happened i actually know it happened uh but i think um it's it's harder because ross was there so mm -hmm. i think it's it's always a little more, bit more complicated when you tell a story in the first person because you know my account of that my view of that in my is very much wrapped up in the ideas and the hatred that were going around in my head at that point in time so perhaps ross uh because you were there for the incident mm -hmm. can uh can relate it uh to all of our friends and listeners out there so an acquaintance of mine um fairly apolitical showed up to this uh verso loft party the valentine's day thing uh verso for the uninitiated is a left-wing book publisher they've got a they've got a loft in brooklyn just one stop away from here um but anyway, she had invited this internet personality with whom I was familiar only because of this viral video that had uh, popped up um, after Trump was elected. And I had I had never even heard of before. And I believe that you, when you and I were talking, you said that's Compot. And I was like, what are you talking about? So this is this guy. He goes by Contbot is his handle. That's K-A-N-T-B-O-T. Kant, as in Immanuel Kant. So he's this... Uh, he was described by a far right website countercurrents as a cherub faced moppet. <laughs> <laughs> Damning him with faint praise. <laughs> Do we know how old he is? He's in his thirties. He's basically wow. a, a philosophy nerd who seized the opportunity when he was presented with it by this news lady who was asking him about his beliefs and why he supported Trump. His response is something about how Trump was going to bring about global cooling, how he was going to raise the cities of Thule and Atlantis, and well, how... Well, while you're on that topic, we do actually have that YouTube clip. So why don't we go ahead and play it now, and then we'll get back to what happened at the Verso party. Mm, excellent idea. Let's see if I can remember how to do this. Uh. I don't believe in democracy. Okay. You know, I believe in Thule, the ancient city, and raising Thule. And I think that Trump is the candidate who's going to raise Thule and Atlantis. I believe in global cooling, cooling the earth, the sea, lo the sea levels lowering, and I believe in land raising from the bottom of the ocean with ancient ruins on it, like the ruins of Thule. And I believe that Trump's going to accomplish all of that. Wow. He's going to prove that UFOs exist. The government has known about it for a long time. They've known that the UFOs are out there and that they're trying to communicate with us and that they have secrets about the origins of human consciousness are you familiar with the philosopher friedrich Schell? so for those of you who can't see this video because we're recording on audio right now i encourage you to look it up it's really really good it's called is trump a german idealist and we'll continue in a second but to set the scene you have an anti-trump rally i believe this was right after the election right mm -hmm. uh and you have this newscaster woman very nice blonde hair she's dressed very very well she appears to be she has an iPhone in her hand, and she appears to be recording She's this guy. She's Facebook living in addition to the main camera. Oh, that's super professional, right? Um, yeah. So that's the context of this. And if you thought that the Thule and the UFO shit was kind of a little bit weird, let's uh, go ahead and hear Kantbot talk about German idealism. Let's, let's hear, him out. hear him out. It's important to have a free exchange of ideas here on the Antifada. Have you read the critical historical introduction to the philosophy of mythology? Schelling is a German idealist philosopher. He was roommates with Holderlin and with Hegel. And he talks about all of this. He predicted it a long time ago. Trump is going to make German idealism real. He's going to complete the system. Kant, he could not complete the system of German idealism. Trump Ooh, is going to complete though. the system. He's going to derive the complete that system. That was terrifying you, right? That terrifies you, right? It terrifies me. How can we complete the system of German idealism? How, how, how do we do it? do it? I don't know. Don't look at you. Hegel know. couldn't do it. Schelling couldn't do it. Victor couldn't do it. Do you think Trump couldn't do it? Maman couldn't do it. No one could, could complete the system of German <laughs> idealism. Well, that would be good. It's good that we don't complete it, right? I mean, almost... <laughs> they look basic to the Yankees. German idealism. It's good. It's good, right? First critique... The dude at the Yankees cap is like, I am not sure how I feel about this. <laughs> German idealism, it sounds uh, a little dicey. He's like, uh, and, th and then he's like, no, it's good. <laughs> he's, not, he's not sure if he wants to complete it. I'm not sure. You know, <laughs> with the Thule and the aliens and yeah, the sea levels and shit. The Yankees cap guy is like, yeah. 
Go ahead. 1781. Trump is a Kantian. I want to make clear to everyone here. Donald Trump is a Kantian. He's a German idealist. They teach wow. Kantian. Okay. Google that. Are you um, are you from New York? No, I'm not from New York. Are you? Uh, how old are you? Yeah, you look really young. Are you okay? Say. <laughs> are you okay? He's <laughs> He's deep on the I can't I can't call it. <laughs> I just want everyone to know, everyone needs to be aware that the system of German idealism is about to be complete. Someone calls him a fascist. Do you know the works of Friedrich Schelling? Do you know about Fichte? Do you know about Fichte? Show off the fucking book learning, fine. Do you know about Fichte? 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 Is that an ironic chant he's using to mock the guy who asks if he's a fascist? I, I think we're going to get to this because we have no fucking idea how serious these people are. It's yeah, so, I mean, I had to give the guy props for seizing this opportunity for trolling live news and for going viral in this way. Um, so I felt like I was meeting a celebrity. Mm-hmm. Um, Th- that's fair. I Should mean, we so watch the rest of it or is that enough? I, I think you, you get, get the gist. The gist. He does right. say All we're right. the alt right. He that does we say we're the alt right. We got power. Trump elected. Yeah. That's the important part. I think, you know, I got to I got to give him props too, not just because he became like mildly like Internet famous on the, the weird left, uh, but also because uh, he had the balls to do that. Like, you know, in this crowd of all these people just talk that complete fucking nonsense and gibberish. Um, which he also did at the party. So let's get back mm. to the story. Yeah. So I mean, I was kind of you know impressed at this stunt that he pulled, um, and I knew that he had written for this uh, far right uh, website, a neo reactionary publication started by this guy Nick Land, who's kind of an esoteric Ugh. philosopher. Ooh, uh, is that the Dark Enlightenment guy? Yeah, Dark Enlightenment. Or is that like NRX. To call it the Endarkenment? Uh-huh. As a goth, that should uh, appeal to your mm, interest. The endarkenment, <laughs> yes, go on. So this this website's called Jacobite Mag, which mm. is a riff on the leftist socialist publication Jacobin Mag. Is that like Pitchfork Reviews Reviews, but for Jacobin? Does he just like critique all the articles in Jacobin? Something like that. I mean, the article That'd that I so read... <laughs> <laughs> the article that I read by him was something about how the so-called dirtbag left would never be edgy. And... Anyway, interacting with this guy in the flesh was not anywhere near as entertaining as I'd hoped. <laughs> and um, eventually he tried to encourage me to go around with him and troll people just in one-on-one conversation in real life. So which... he saw you as like kind of a fellow traveler. He's like, this guy might have the chops to become the new Kant body. Maybe he was training you like a fucking ninja master or something. I think I, I, I got his references. I, I, I read philosophy, you know, in my undergrad so I, you know, I knew what he was talking about. And I guess he was, he, th- he thought that, you know, having watched his video, I could sort of follow him around and uh, do his spiel. Um, Trolling IRL. <laughs> Aren't IRL trolls just called dicks? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's going to be like something trolling a big crowd of like people. Like that predates or, the internet. Yeah, I mean, what's, a, what's mildly impressive, like, on a newscast, like, is just weird and awkward in person. So... Sean at some point showed up. I mean, he was already pretty loaded. I was pr- I was six seven in as I as I tend to be when I show up at the party. Uh, I can parties. confirm that. Yeah, and I tried to sort of explain to him that this guy was sort of an alt right celebrity. Um, I think that Sean asked him if he was friends with Nick Land and uh, Mencius Mulbug. Um, I recall actually. You, you kind of, as you said, you kind of set the whole thing up and you said this guy, you know, had this viral video and, mm-hmm. you know, it's crazy that he's here. I'm not sure I really had the sense that he was like a serious uh, right wing crypto fast sort of person. But I believe when we were in conversation, I asked him about land and I asked him about that fucking monster person, uh, Mencius Moldbug. And he like very much in the affirmative was like, yeah, dark enlightenment. And then I was like, Ugh. so go on. So I guess Sean has done this before. Um, mm-hmm. I'd only heard rumor of it, <laughs> but got to witness it firsthand. He did this sort of deadpan, set up his some timer on his on his <laughs> on his phone and said, you know, all right, you've got 10 minutes. You can stay here. Once this timer is up, you know, you know, go around to the party. You know, say your goodbyes. <laughs> if you're still here, I'm going to beat your ass. Mm-hmm. It's true. And I was afraid, like, 
I know that he wasn't bluffing because he has done this before. <laughs> um, just earlier, in fact, at that party, uh, he kind of got up in the face of a guy who uh, kind of knocked into me and spilled my drink all over me. And when I was like, hey, he was like, uh, whatever. And Sean's like, what? Which one? Which one was it, babe? Show me which one it was. And then I'm like, no, it's really fine. And he's like, no, it's not. And he came up to him. He went up to him and he's like, did you spill a drink on my wife? And he was like, what? You want me to buy her another one? And he was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> and then he's like, fine. And he did. And he's like, here's your wine. And I was like, wow. Yeah, we win. You're kind of a dick, but I love that I have. I never thought I would be with a man so butch. I'm your, that I'm your white knight. you would be able knight. to force. Uh, I know. I'm starting to sound like I'm a your, trad wife I'm here. your white knight for white wine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was white wine. And in fact, I had seen this happen at a number of parties before like many years ago when we just started dating well, let's get down to the we'll okay. get to that but let's get down to like the uh denouement of the verso thing because it doesn't end as uh spectacularly as we would imagine oh, yeah so sean came up to me and he told me the same thing that you just said right i set a timer for 10 minutes and i told this guy if he doesn't leave i'm gonna kick his ass and i was like all right i guess sean's getting in a fight at this party yeah i mean i was you know the the setup was you know pretty it was exciting. I was hoping that I was going to see the, see Sean throw down here at this party. You know, there were probably, you know, over 100 people oh, yeah, in easy. the loft. Yeah. Definitely. And, you know, I wondered how, you know, it would play out if some sort of like, there'd be some sort of clearing and like it would, you know, like <laughs> be like surrounded on all sides by various weird Pinata. leftists. Yeah, uh -oh. exactly. <laughs> Only, <laughs> see, that would have been much more like, like to have an actual blood sport at the first yeah, oh yeah. would have been, yeah, you know, that would have been cool. why fuck with effigies when you could have the real <laughs> thing? Yeah, exactly. Or like in a Michael Jackson video, like we both have switchblades and we're like, you know, sexy mm -hmm. dance fighting. Yeah, sexy dance fighting. Well, what what ends up happening, and um, you know, I, I guess I was definitely not bluffing because I had many drinks in me. But what ended up happening is that because I'm an older man now, unlike when I met Jamie, and um, I actually. I'm able to have second thoughts. Uh, I had second thoughts about this, and I said to myself, wait, I know the guy who runs the Verso Loft. <laughs> I should probably not get into a fist fight, especially against this uh, cherubic God. moppet. Can you, you know, imagine not the very tweets nice. that would have resulted from that? It would have been very bad for everybody, and it would have been disrespecting my friends and their space. I was honestly like... Uh, a lot of the times I get into into shit with people is because, you know, it's like a loyalty to friends and the Verso loft, you know, like a lot of my friends were there and it was a, it's a left space. And you had somebody coming in here who was spouting, you know, some fucking neo fascist shit. And that that really set me off. But when I went and I talked to Jake, he basically said, we've had this happen before and we've had security, you know, take care of the whole thing. He said, but what we'll do first is we'll go. Wait, and they've had Nazis show up before. They've had, uh, or they've had people fights. similar. Right no, wing. They, people similar, like right wing mm. people showing up just to start shit. But like, uh, basically, I talked to Jake. Jake went up to the guy, basically told him like, "Are you gonna be cool?" And Kantbot was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna be cool." And I guess he didn't end up like IRL, like individually trolling people with Ross Wolf, like throughout the party. And it was kind of a let, like an anticlimactic letdown to the whole thing. But uh, hmm. you know, I, I had to respect how the space. That conversation went. I had to respect Jake is the space. so polite. He's a very <laughs> nice British boy. He's a British lad. Are you going to start anything? Are you planning to start anything? I can't. I can't even do it. So you were saying, uh, I, I think you you had this bizarre reputation because, you know, I don't. I really don't think fighting is cool, and I, I've been in my fair share of fights. But again, you know, I'm closer to forty than I am to thirty at this point in time, and. Uh, I think uh, the whole thing is kind of lame and whatever. But I think when you and I met, I was 29. Mm -hmm. So I was in my 20s. I might have been a little young, dumb, and uh, full of uh, you-know-what then. So. Yeah, I mean, God. <sighs> I got to think, think way back. About seven and a half, almost eight years ago. Almost eight years. When we were first going out. Um, this happened a couple times in a row where I was with Sean at a party. And he got in a fight. And I was like, wow. The first time, I mean, I just, like I said, I, I date emo girly men, you know? Like, I never thought I would end up with a man with enough testosterone coursing through his veins oh, to even on. think about Get getting in a, a physical <laughs> altercation with somebody. So um, the first time, uh, it was, like, like he said, he was backing up his friends. And his friends were 
in the right, I would say, this guy was being a real jerk. I think it was at, was it at Asher's yeah, house? Yeah, it was on his roof. He had a roof party, and this one guy was, like, being drunk and causing problems and refusing to leave. So, like, you know, Sean helped to throw him out, and then it got physical, and... There was a little bit of a fight. These two guys showed up to the party and they were not invited to the party and they were hitting on um, the women there in really creepy ways and actually like starting to touch on our friends, I should say, our female friends. I didn't know them that well, but our friend Asher, whose party it was, basically told them to get the fuck out. And they were like, no. Like, I don't know why if there's 150, 200 people on a rooftop and you're two people, you're like, no, I'm not leaving. But that's what they said. So at a certain point, you know, Asher gets all these people together. He's like, listen, we got to get these guys out of here. Asher, because he's fucking, he was crazier back then. He's still crazy. It goes downstairs with an old, like, table of his, and he starts breaking the legs off of it to beat, <laughs> oh, yeah. these, beat these I guys. I forgot like. about the table. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all these people are getting all riled up. And, you know, me and a bunch of other people, as a whole crowd, like, went up and said, you must go. You're being disrespectful to people. This is this guy's house. You have to leave, you know, trying to help our friend out. And the reason I got personally involved in the whole thing is because uh, Homeboy took a swing at me. And he just barely missed me. If I get swung at, I'm going to swing back. So I went and I uh, got him right in the face. And uh, I fell back onto one of, you know, like, you know, on the rooftops in Brooklyn, there's those pyramid type windows with like the chicken wire in it. Like the, yeah. what should we call it? Um, yeah, we know what you're talking about. The skylight things, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I punch the dude, and then like his friend pushes me, and I fall back onto that thing. Ooh. So now I'm on glass and chicken wire. Ooh. And the one guy, he's like, got his fist up in the air. He's about to just like slam me right in the face. And my, my sweet, dear friend Rob comes out of nowhere, and he's got all these rings and shit. And he just like comes <laughs> flying right as this guy's about to hit me and gets the dude right in the jaw, like knocks one of his teeth out, like blood everywhere and shit like that. And um, yeah, Rob was really bummed about that. He was so sad. He's like, I don't like to home. fight. I, I Never didn't... let it be said, though, that man rings are not functional. No, they're mm. very turquoise in the face. That's mm. just like mm. adult. That's <laughs> that's insult and injury at, mm -hmm. at once. Mm -hmm. I think the other one, though, uh, yeah, no, I heard so about this one, other one. That one was like arguably fine. Right. Like he has a pretty good, uh, pretty good justification for it. The second and I and I was like, all right, I'm reacting neutrally to this. But then the second one was not that long late after this. And the second one, his friends were definitely in the wrong. And it's funny because it was an identical scenario yes. where some assholes were refusing to leave a party. But they only were the assholes, assholes. Were, <laughs> were his friends. Not only were they our assholes, but it was it's, like, it's like one American, like a, a very angry uh, Greek comrade, uh, female comrade, and a very, um, uh, how shall I say, pretentious and snotty French male comrade, uh, when you get Greeks and French together and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it can be never, a never good mix. Yeah. The party was ending. This is my, friend. there at like this is my friend's <laughs> house, by the way, my friend Lauren and the party was ending. She's like, all right, everybody leave now. And she didn't know these people. And they're like, we do not believe in private property. <laughs> we will not leave your house until we are ready. This is my, this is uh, Leon de Matisse, which who kind people... of well known in communization circles. <laughs> yeah, in sure, sure he it's is. A pretty well known. Uh, They're just like sitting leftist. there smoking like, no, <laughs> we will not live. He's a very smart and, and cool and sweet guy, but he was being a real dick. But it was the same thing. I mean, like right or wrong at that point in time in my life. And I guess even now to an extent, it's like, you know, when it's your friends, it's your friends. So I actually tried to mediate first, to be honest. Like I went up to Laura and I was like, look, I'm going to try my best to get them out. And, you know, then he's smoking cigarettes like, uh, you know, like unfiltered rolled cigarettes. Like uh, <laughs> you are a proprietarian. We do not leave your house. We stay all night. She's and she's like, like nice Why are you hipster girl <laughs> who <laughs> doesn't read <laughs> obscure Marxist theory. <laughs> They they were he was basically like communizing her apartment and then like uh, basically they uh, her boyfriend and their friends uh, forcibly began to kick everybody out and I was again trying to mediate I was trying to make everything cool but then as we were kind of everyone was pushing each other and we went down the stairways and my stairway and my friends went out the door first uh, there was an empty forty uh, forty bottle in the foyer. And uh, one of the dudes who was uh, Lauren's um, 
boyfriend. boyfriend's friend uh, picked up that empty 40 bottle. So now I'm like, all right, it's go- this guy's going to smash a bottle mm-hmm. over my friend's face. So we went out there. We scrapped for a while. I definitely got a good shot right in Lauren's uh, boyfriend's boyfriend. face. Yeah. And uh, it kind of broke itself up. And, you know, we all went home. And, no, Lauren- and then he came with us after that back to my house. <laughs> <laughs> this is the difference between men and women. Like if my friend hit me in the face, if my female friend hit me in the face, I would be really mad at her. And I probably wouldn't talk to her for at least like a day. But no, like as soon as this fight was over, everything was cool. And he came back to our house. He came back to my house with us and we hung out for like three more wow. hours. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Uh, that was very uh, gender essentialist of you, by the way. I know. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to go uh, read some uh, self crit bell hooks and <laughs> penance after I go home. I, I think that like the um, the end of that story like is that Lauren, for as long as she was dating that guy, every time I saw her, I was like, you're such a dick. You punched my boyfriend. And then after like five or six months, she broke up with him and she was like, it's cool. <laughs> it's no problem. Kind of glad that you did. Yeah. So I was like thinking to myself, wow, is this going to be a fucking problem? I think yeah. I actually asked you that. You I, this is one of Straight my favorite up. questions to ask people, by the way. Is this Besides a- how pure is your hate? Yes. Is, is either do we have a fucking problem or is this a fucking problem? And he was like, no, I swear I never get in fights. It's just it's just so happened that, you know, circumstances converged at these two parties. Like this isn't this isn't my thing. I'm not a fight guy. And it turned out that he was telling the truth. I've been in very few fights since then. Uh, that was just the summer of fights. And to put the whole thing in context, and, and <laughs> really I'm, get, I'm getting a little, you know, going back about 10 years or so now. But um You know, my 20s were a a very nihilistic phase, and we're going to talk a lot about politics and theory and stuff today, but it was also nihilistic in in political terms, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. I had very, very sort of uh, dark visions of things, and as I was in my late late 20s and I met Jamie, I was hanging out with some real, uh, some people who really share that sort of nihilistic, destructive and uh, self-destructive tendency. You know, they were anarchists, they were uh, socialists, they were communists, they were weird, like, art kids or whatever. But for some reason, everybody loved to fucking scrap. You know, we had all been to, I won't say why, but we had all been to jail, you know, to central booking together at least once. You know, I think that that that, when I was 29 years old, when we met, that was sort of this this last gasp of my uh, nihilistic, like, I don't give a fuck, go out and drink Mm. uh, and, and smash it up thing. Um, what changed your mind? I mean, you were a nice part of that, actually. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I was fishing for a compliment, and it totally worked. It totally worked. <laughs> that, and I stopped drinking hard liquor for a while after that. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah, but, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll end this, and we'll, we'll get back into the, the political stuff uh, by saying that the other fight that happened that uh, summer, and I really regret that I wasn't there for it, uh, there was another roof party uh, on Cook Street uh, in Brooklyn. Oh, God. And all of my friends were there. And uh, uh, I was supposed to go out, but I ended up like, I forget what it was. But You're I ended up sad you out. missed that? You're sad you didn't get your ribs I, broken I by will, the cops? I will tell you why I'm sad, okay? And it's real and it's material. Mm. So my friends, the cops, long story short, the cops try to break up this party. They don't know who they're fucking dealing with. Mm. They no, they thought it was a bunch of fucking hipster marshmallow yeah, they, white kids. <laughs> snowflakes. They were gonna be easy to deal with. Yeah, except that they didn't realize they were like, you know, psychopathic uh, Italian Americans from, uh, you know, North Jersey and Puerto Ricans from Bensonhurst who had a chip <laughs> on their shoulder and like used to stab uh, all sorts of stuff. So the <laughs> cops try to break up the party. And somebody throws a 40 bottle, again, the 40, throws a 40 bottle at one of the cops, and then all fucking hell breaks loose. The whole party and all the cops all go out into the street, and uh, there's video of this, there was video of it. It was a running fucking street battle. It was like 30 (laughs) people against like maybe like five cops, you know, or four or five cops, like two cars, and people were like, punching cops it was going back and forth (laughs) and shit got crazy and then finally like the backup came and uh one of our friends used as evidence in court a uh, beautiful video where our friend who's i will not name uh is handcuffed uh and he's uh face forward against a cop car and he's yelling at the top of his lungs fuck the pigs fuck the (laughs) fucking police and meanwhile the (laughs) cops have him handcuffed and they're just beating him with batons and he's like fuck you (laughs) Fuck you. And then this old timer, like, you know, this old cop who knows what he's doing. My boy's screaming at the top of his lungs. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he, like, stops for a second and he squares up. 
you know, at my boy's back. And he gets him right in the rib, the one right, bu- right, right, right by the kidney oh, in shit. the back. And my guy's like, fuck the, oh, and breaks his rib. So the reason why I regret being at that fight is because, because of the videos that came out. Everybody got a sixty thousand dollars settlement from the oh, NYPD. Mm. So for all that fighting that summer, I could have got a sixty thousand dollar payout. But you know what? I'm happy for them. I'm, I'm glad they did it. <laughs> I mean, are you happy that you didn't get your ribs broken at least? I mean, how much is a rib really worth? How much is it worth? I mean, uh, like, I mean, have you ever had a rib broken? No. Sixty thousand each. Uh, I don't know how many <laughs> ribs they had broken, but let's just say, for the sake of example, it's like ten thousand dollar a rib. You know, ten thousand dollars will keep you fed for like you know, a couple months, a few months, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's a silver lining, but I probably wouldn't sign up to take that deal, you know. Well, I think you had to be there at the time. You know, yeah. you had to be yelling like "fuck the police" yeah. uh, and uh, in, in in a running street battle, throwing bottles at cop cars and smashing in windows and stuff like that. You know, I'm I don't go honest, in for that shit anymore. I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, I was a little freaked out by all your friends. <laughs> When we first met, that's fair. They seemed a little bit crazy, they and their they their concept of uh, leftist politics seemed very like violent and masculine, and like something I couldn't fully participate in. It was, and that's uh, part of what drove me into the arms of the DSA. Was I needed to? <laughs> you wanted to not be me and my friends. I I, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted something that I could feel like a full participant in, and I wanted to have my own thing, and do something where I could be more a uh, part of it unless like I was riding a man's coattails. That's fair. And honestly, like I said, I grew out of that whole thing. That was kind of my last hurrah. But just so you know, it wasn't all toxic masculinity. One of the other events that happened uh, that year was our friend. Uh, her name starts with an N. We won't mention it on air. Uh, somebody touched her at Union Pool uh, in an inappropriate way. And she smashed a, she smashed a bottle over his head, and uh, they ended up uh, curb stomping the guy. So I mean, it wasn't just the guys; it was also yeah, the sure. women too. So. But like, yeah, still crazy. Still, did she yeah. curb stomp him herself, or did she just oversee it? She oversaw it. She was like a foreman. She's like a little to the left, a <laughs> little to the right. She's doing hand signals and stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it all worked out well. The job got done. You know? Yeah, I guess mm-hmm. it's, it's not just that I'm a woman, right? It's also that I am a coward. Uh, I've seen you in <laughs> Who street doesn't enjoy before. violence. You've done fine. I, so. Yeah, okay. I'll take it. I'll All take right. it. So I think we're, we're like dancing around um, nihilistic politics, right? Uh, something that, again, I grew out of as I started to, when the crisis came especially, tried to kind of uh, have a deeper understanding of the world uh, beyond this sort of, I don't know, anarcho-situationist sort of bullshit crime think, whatever thing that I was into for a long time. Uh, which I think is a good opportunity for us to um, formally introduce and, and talk a little bit uh, with Ross about uh, what it is that he does. Oh, yeah. Um, I understand you have a blog, Ross. Yeah, it's called The Charnel House. It's from a, a French-Swiss architect. He wrote something in the mid-20s saying that our world, like a charnel house, is filled with the, de- de- with the detritus of dead epochs. Which I thought sounded cool and grim dark, and basically, I mean, it's it's very aesthetically oriented. Um, I'm interested in architecture and aesthetics, and uh, you know, in addition to politics, I mean, a lot of this stuff intersects. Historically, there were communists who wanted to, as they saw it, build socialism, and there were architects who were socialistically inclined who wanted to build in a much more literal sense a sort of new form to uh, give expression to this, you know, collectivist, you know, global vision of a sort of unified humanity where there would not be just, you know, local styles and different variants and people, you know, living at various levels of development around the world, but rather a sort of global effort whereby, you know, the working classes of all countries would unite and build a better future. And we're talking about uh, things like um, council housing in Red Vienna. We're talking about things like the Bauhaus movement, right? You know, high modernism, which was very much uh, had its left elements and then also with Carbusier had its right elements, but was very much, as you said, this sort of universal project, right, of uh, creating a um, a global aesthetic, a uniform aesthetic that was uh, meant to unite people, you know, Mm -hmm. whether that was a machine for living or whether it was creating aesthetically beautiful uh, decommodified housing, you know, mm-hmm. 
So what does that look like in practice? Because I feel like the architecture I would most associate with communism is like Soviet architecture, maybe? It's, it's just like universally acknowledged as being very drab and depressing. Yeah, well, I mean, coming out of World War One, you know, Europe was in flames. You know, c cities that had been, that had existed for, you know, over a millennium, you know, were in ruins. And the idea was that, you know, despite the sort of objective nihilism of the war, there was this sort of opportunity to rebuild the world, to remake it in the image of a sort of unified humanity. Now, there was a lot of, you know, the historically contingent factors. Um, a lot of, you know, influence was taken from uh, Cubist painting, from futurist movements in Italy and Russia. And, I mean, a lot of the aesthetics that developed, I mean, there was a sort of more expressionist moment in in Germany, a sort of cathedral for socialism was envisioned uh, in the early Bauhaus. But eventually, after the blockade of Russia ended in the early 20s, there was a sort of westward movement of this very abstract art and corresponding to that architecture. My main interest probably aesthetically is in German functionalism, uh, the Bauhaus, Neue Sachlichkeit, and uh, Russian constructivism, which... Oh, that is cool stuff. It really I is. I studied a bit of it in college. It's awesome. Didn't we see some stuff at the Tate? Was it the Tate? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we saw uh, some Malevich paintings and paper cutouts, I think. Yeah, and one of Malevich's students, this guy Elisitsky, who traveled to Germany, um, was kind of the mentor for a Hungarian artist named uh, Moholy Negi, um, sort of brought constructivism to the West. In fact, he told uh, reporters that he wasn't bringing art to the West. He was bringing communism via art to the West. Um, unfortunately, because of the isolation of Russia and the sort of reactionary drift of politics from the 20s into the 30s, um, not just in Western Europe, where fascism, of course, took hold in Italy and then in Germany and Spain, um, but also in Russia, where uh, there had been, you know, a sort of very cosmopolitan internationalist left, which then shifted to a policy of socialism in one country right. under Stalin. It took a much more conservative turn, and that's where you get these kind of what they call the Stalinist Gothic, you know, aesthetic, these massive skyscrapers that have, you know, columns and all these historical references, very Baroque in terms of like the detailing, which is very antithetical to the modernist vision that originally existed. And then I think too, um, you know, that's for the, the monumental public architecture in the Soviet Union. And then what Jamie's, uh, I think, describing, which we've all seen pictures of, uh, I believe, uh, are the... Um, the apartment buildings, right? The apartment mm -hmm. blocks made of uh, cinder blocks, right? Yeah, we've seen those prefab. IRL when we were in Berlin. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I saw the IRL in... Or uh, Mountain. I saw the IRL in Romania, especially when I went to Romania. Uh, they're, they're all over the place. And that, and correct me if I'm wrong because you're the expert here, but um, you, know, you have this monumental architecture on the one hand, similar to, as you said, cathedrals, right? Are supposed to be this, give this sense of grandeur, right? And... Um, uh, some sort of imprimatur of authority uh, to the church. And in the sense, you know, we saw that uh, with the Soviet state. But you still have a, a situation of scarcity, right? Uh, you know, under Stalin, you still have a situation of some would argue primitive accumulation in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of those apartment blocks are built in the mostly in the 50s, right? But it's essentially a mass produced, but banal and drab form of architecture, but that actually served human needs, right? The, what people were moving from, you know, into the, what we now see as these drab Stalinist apartment blocks or Khrushchev, uh, apartment mm -hmm. blocks was a huge step up for people who had been living four or five families in one apartment, or they'd been living on, you know, some, in a, a shack on a, on a collective farm, right? Yeah. I mean, w starting with Khrushchev, there was an attempt to return to the more utopian and, for all of his faults and for all of the ways that he, you know, tacitly continued Stalinism, despite, you know, formally, you know, denouncing Stalin's legacy. Um, Khrushchev was probably an earnest utopian. He thought that he could, you know, catch up and overtake the West. He could thought that he could raise the standard of living uh, to compete with the West, not just in terms of like heavy industry and uh, nuclear stockpile, but in terms of actually providing goods for people. Um, and 
there was a kind of standardized housing. This was one of the old modernist dreams was that, you know, they, they thought like, okay, we, we all wear standardized clothes, you know, medium, large, extra large. Um, we all buy standardized goods. Why do we still, you know, commission architects to design these sort of unique, you know, once in a lifetime buildings that are supposed to be distinct from all the others we should have, you know, especially cool. for housing. I mean, yeah, I mean, tastes vary, but, uh, one of the things that they really sought to sort of correct, you know, something that Engels had even written about a century earlier was the housing question, mm. the massive capitalism, influx. Capitalism cannot solve the housing question. It can only move it around, right? The housing problem. Was that yeah. Crazy? And I mean, you still even see it today. I mean, it, today it's almost, you know, a surfeit of, of housing availability. You know, there's all these vacant, you know, apartments that are just sitting there. You know, there's even, you know, rent being paid on them, but nobody living in them because nobody can afford them. Um, but at the time, it was a question of scarcity and a question of a massive population influx to the cities, something that's characteristic of modernity in general, whether it's capitalist or nominally socialist, as it was in the Soviet Union. Um, there's a massive shift of the center of population from the countryside to the city. And that's where you get a lot of these kind of bleak, you know, personally, I, I I'm into that aesthetic. <laughs> um, a lot of what I began to sort of post these these Plattenbauten or Blachowie, uh, the sort of panel housing, which had its equivalent in Britain and so on as brutalism. Um, I began to post these images, very aesthetic, of uh, under the hashtag Doom. Yes, Doom. So Doom, like this was, I don't know, four or five years ago. I'm a big fan of Doom. I've actually done a couple of Doom posts myself. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not sure if other people sort of independently co-discovered it or if, you know, I just sort of, you know, unconsciously, you know, acquired it from somebody else. I can't remember anybody else doing it, but even if they did, you know, I'm kind of glad that it's caught on. It's part part of this. I mean, and maybe it's something to do with the nihilism that you were talking mm -hmm. about. Um, applied to aesthetics, it's, you know, these kinds of, it's Beton Brut. It's this... Uh, you know, these very dreary buildings, kind of massive, you know, crushing human scale, um, bleak windswept plazas. Um, that's all shit that I'm really into. Brasilia, right, is a is a yeah. perfect example of that. Yeah, it's which was co designed by you a know, communist. Yeah, <laughs> Oscar Niemeyer right. and uh Corbusier. The the thing with Corbusier's fascism is interesting. I mean, really architects more than any other, you know, field of art are tied to power that exists because so many resources have to be marshaled for the construction of anything. Uh, whereas like a painter, all, all they need is a canvas, um, you know, a singer, all they need is a stage. Um, you have to, you have to get, you know, zoning approved. You have to, you know, get materials and, you know, budget basically for construction. You're very beholden to the powers that be wherever they are. So somebody like Corbusier, I mean, he tried to uh, you know, he submitted a proposal for the uh, the League of Nations building in Geneva. It was, you know, supposed to be the, the center of bourgeois internationalism. After that failed, after his proposal was rejected, he tried to design for the Palace of the Soviets in Moscow. Mm. Eventually, um, you know, when fascism was ascendant in Italy and later in Vichy, France, um, you know, like any good architect, you know, he appealed to the fascists. Um, really, you know, very uh, mercenary in terms of his political allegiances. But Oscar Niemeyer, who died a few years ago at the age of like 104 or something yeah. like that, um, he designed Brasilia in, it's often criticized for being like gargantu, like for its gigantism um, and for not respecting sort of human norms of scale. But um, I guess it captures a kind of doom aesthetic that I'm into. But I gotta say, when it comes to aesthetics, the fascists have us beat. <laughs> well, I mean, that's From the uniforms <laughs> to the <laughs> futurism and the sculpture and the architecture. It's like it's pretty sick. It's a funny, funny story. That, you know, it, it reminds me of what you just said. Is uh, I I went to Spain for a while to to study Spanish when I was uh, at college for uh, you know I went for five weeks or whatever, and um, I went to uh, Valle de los Caídos which is uh, where traditionally the royalty was buried uh, in Spain. But uh, it was also where Francisco Franco, that famous fascist in Spain, uh, built 
this humongous chapel into a mountainside. Uh, it's actually nice. sick. fucking gorgeous. Um, awesome. It's got uh, a cross on top of this mountain <laughs> that there was an elevator that only Franco could take up. He was the only one allowed to go to the top of this cross so we could overlook the entire valle. Um, so when I was on the tour, on the guy, uh, guided tour, uh, it was in Spanish. Um, and the woman uh, was, sh you know, showing all these statues and stuff like that. And I'm looking, you know, and this was, these were done in the you know, early 40s, I'd say, into the 50s and, and 60s and so. But it was like Art Deco. And it was beautiful fucking mm. monumental Art Deco, which I fucking love, you know these statues of these sort of heroic men and women, you know, but done in this very modernist way. And I was trying to explain to her that this is Art Deco, this is Art Deco, but because it's Spain, you know, this tour guide was an mm -hmm. older woman, so she probably lived under Franco, was, was yelling at me in Spanish, like, no, this is fascist, this is fascist, this is fascist. But to me, it was like, oh, I feel like, you know, it's like the Chrysler building or something <laughs> like that. It was very amazing aesthetics, and the whole chapel, again, carved into a mountainside, was a monumental and beautiful thing. Unfortunately, it was just at the service of Spanish fascism. Yeah, that's what um, Walter Benjamin uh, famously uh, postulated, was that fascism represents the aestheticization of politics. And, you know, it's funny, you can even find, like, old notebooks uh, of Hitler, who was, you know, a very mediocre painter, but <laughs> designing... If only he had gone into art, art school, we might have all been better off. But he uh, designed all these different logos and uniforms, like, you know, some demented kid you know mm -hmm. imagining some alternate universe and some empire only he eventually realized it um but anyway beyond just the aesthetics of uh doom which i guess caught on in a certain way i began applying it more generally to just sort of the grim reality of you know political conditions at present which i mean i guess i had my hopeful phase to a certain extent when i was like 15 or 16 <laughs> and you know i was against the war the build-up to war in iraq and i thought oh hey you know we've got these huge you know marches that we're mobilizing you know maybe we can actually stop this of course oh, God, yeah, i that. think that was a defining experience for a lot of people our age politically i, I think you and i have talked about this right you were yeah. very uh, we were all very disheartened after that 2003 to 2000 and eight or nine were horribly, horribly depressing, oh, yeah. despairing times. What really depressed me even more than just the fact that we went to war was that people actually considered these marches a success. Right. And I was thinking to myself, like, I mean, if we're anti-war, then the goal, the measure of success should be stopping the war, yeah. not just turning out and sort of congratulating ourselves right. for... Oh, we had a really good time at the protest. Yeah, we said not in our name, whatever. Um... Which, as Adam Curtis has pointed out, is a very neoliberal anti-war slogan when people go, not in my name. I think that was the main chant. Not mm -hmm. in my name. Yeah, because like, you absolve right, yourself. Well, we're going to do it in someone else's name then. Is that cool? <laughs> <laughs> Halliburton or whatever, Dick yeah. Cheney. It, regardless, I mean, I remember seeing the entire anti-war movement more or less disintegrate into a sort of extended vegan bake sale for Obama's mm -hmm. campaign in Good 2008. Yeah. And... At that point, I became, you know, I'd already begun to really despair of, you know, real hope for actually being able to, I mean, certainly, like, I had no interest in the Democrats, um, and, really, Same. you know, very little hope in actually, like, the, the sort of activist politics that I saw around campus. Same. Um, so, I mean, with the, and even then, like, in 2008, if you would have told me, like, that eight years from then, you know, after Obama was nominated, that the star of Celebrity Apprentice was going to be our president and that all of these ridiculous things were going to happen, I probably would not have believed a word of it. It would have seemed too ridiculous and just outlandish. I think we can all agree on that. <sighs> Which is why, like, I think, I mean, I mean, just seeing, like, th there's almost, like, a, you know, an embarrassment of riches when it comes to, like, just absurd political material that you can just post and say, like, you know, we're fucked. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like mm -hmm. almost like a uh, darker version of that humans of late capitalism thing. Yeah. You know, which, totally. Right? <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> I mean, it goes that. along with, I mean, some of the humor, like. You want to give us some examples, by the way? Oh, shit. Where people just got to lick it up for themselves. Like, um, what would be a good Doom post? You should have done homework on your own Facebook posts for this show. <laughs> 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 oh, so, I mean, I don't know. Um, just the, the all of the different artists, you know, 
not refusing to play Trump's inauguration, but then three doors down or something like that, or like some like ridiculous, at least aesthetically. Um, I recently posted one of a porta potty, a double porta potty, which I mean, no, no barrier, no. They're, they're just two toilet seats uh, side by side. That's my fucking nightmare. <laughs> oh yeah. You don't know this about me, but I am very pee shy. <laughs> that's well. Well, it's not just no pee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's similar to the old. Uh, this is dating myself, but the old uh, uh, SNL sketch, the love toilet. Uh, <laughs> anybody? <laughs> no. Yes. Okay. Thanks. People look that up if you haven't seen it. I think it's Kevin Nielsen. It's really funny. So that's disturbing. A porta a porta potty that you you open it up and there's two seats. I guess side so. by side, no oh, partition. God. You know what? Real comrades poo in front of each other. Yeah, that, that's not the communism I want to see. <laughs> it's a kind of intimacy, right? It's the difference between uh, private property and personal property, right? <laughs> like everyone still gets privacy when they poo, and everyone still gets their own toothbrush and vibrator. Yeah, you know? yeah, right. <laughs> that's different. That's that's okay. We're, We're not, not talking trying means to get rid of, of production that. here. We're talking <laughs> privies. I'll take it. All right. Did you uh, have a couple questions on architecture? Uh, yeah, a couple of things popped into my head while you were talking. Um, and the first one is uh, maybe I've been listening to a lot of Russell Brand's podcast lately. Good podcast. But uh, yeah, if really you can keep up with surprisingly them. good. He seems like such a bozo. And then you hear him talk about politics and you're like, oh, marry me. <laughs> but um, like the idea of grandeur in architecture or even just like oddity like i read a piece by nathan robinson recently in current affairs where he's like why are we getting rid of things that are old and cool oh yeah and that castle he used to weird live in as a student because yeah. like what's inherently better about stuff being you know cement blocks um which brings me to a different thing i was going to talk about which is that rich people all live in housing that looks like soviet architecture now but is very very expensive um <laughs> but like the idea that like the cathedrals of yore, they were created, they were designed to create sort of some sense of grandeur, right? Some sense of awe in people. And this is something that a lot of people think is missing from communist thought right now, right? Mm. Because communism and Marxism is necessarily atheistic, I think, um, at least in its traditional form. And like the idea that we are more than the flesh. We're more than just the materials around us. We're more than our utility as a cog in the machine. That doesn't have to involve God. Mm -hmm. Like I believe in all of those things and I believe that we are all connected and we all have rights. And that's just like a kind of faith that I have because Ooh. I don't take, I take God out of this mm -hmm. idea. But if there were some way for a communist to reproduce this sense of awe, this sense of like some people would call it spiritual, right? Like that's what Bernie Sanders says his spirituality is. And Russell that Brand too talks dodge. a lot about that. Well, Russell Brand is spiritual. Yeah. But but he uh, does connect that to the social. But, yeah, but Bernie, Bernie wouldn't Sanders call like, it. He wouldn't call it God. When they asked him about it, like if he like, believes I in believe God, he's like, we're I, all in this together. I believe that humanity is all as one, and we must <laughs> abolish the value form. <laughs> no, I didn't say that a second. Do you throw God? But like, is there <laughs> storm the heavens? And I think that is like a real part of the human mind or some human need that's not being fulfilled by atheistic communism. So, do you think there might be a way to do that without making question. it about God? Yeah. So, I mean, in the aftermath of the the Russian Revolution, there was, you know, the question of what would replace, you know, sort of the communal gatherings that religion had once, you know, sort of served that function. And Trotsky, I mean, this was around the same time that uh, cinemas were beginning to be spread. And looking at the sort of, you know, objective content of religion, there's the sort of belief in the divine, something that's higher than us, um, something that's beyond our ability to know. And at least for Trotsky and for most of the atheists who were involved in Bolshevism, you know, for them, that was all dispensable. You could get rid of that what was necessary you know, the sort of function that religion served was this kind of ritual or routine. Even Freud talked about, you know, the repetition of, uh, you know, saying hail Mary's or just, you know, attending, going to a gathering place every week and seeing, you know, members of the community. I Th believe Freud too. Didn't he talk about not spiritual experience per se, but a sort of oceanic feeling? Yeah. Sort of infinity. Right. Yeah. Something that's sublime, a sort of, 
you know, collective experience of mankind um, or something that's ineffable in some way. Um, Trotsky thought that this could be replaced by, you know, you know, communist gatherings by new holidays. They re replaced the old religious saint holidays with holidays, you know, commemorating the Paris Commune or, you know, the 1905 revolution or famous revolutionaries of the past. Uh, they even began renaming or naming new children uh, Vladlen or like other or barricada, which means barricade in, in Russian, instead of, you know, adopting the, it used to be the practice that if you were born on the day of a saint, you would take the name of the saint. And a lot of this impulse uh, is kind of a, uh, comes out of the French Revolution, right? Which redesigns the entire calendar, right? Creates a revolutionary ca uh, calendar. Yeah, year um, zero, everything's a sort of decimal right. system. You know, there aren't 12 hours, there are now 10 hours. I mean, this is, you know, to some extent reproduced in Fritz Long's Metropolis, but mm. in a more utopian than dystopic way. But what you're alluding to, this sort of sense of grandeur and scale, this sort of sense of something higher than us. I mean, I've, I've read... Nathan Robinson's, uh, you know, Screeds Against Modernism. I intended to write some sort of incredibly mean polemic. Um, <laughs> calling, as, you, as you tend to do. Yeah, calling him a, a poor man's Tom Wolfe or <laughs> uh, <laughs> something along those lines. Uh, Tom Wolfe, you know, very good writer like Nathan is, but very conservative when it comes to his tastes. Um, I mean, Stalinism, one could say, maybe did attempt to capture that sense of, you know, grandiosity. Um, the proposal for the palace of the Soviets that did eventually get um, accepted was going to be supposedly larger than, taller than uh, the Empire State Building, which was the tallest in the world at the time. Just a uh, call back here, but just as uh, Francisco Franco's uh, cross on top of the, um, the underground mm. uh, tomb that he built was one meter higher than the Eiffel Tower. Mm. Mm -hmm. Go on. Well, that on was purpose. in service of Stalin, though, like... Has there ever been something like that in service of something good? Well, I mean, I mean, under Stalinism, Stalin was considered good. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I, I like guess there's, there's a distinction. I mean, returning to Kant, I mean, Kant thought, whatever. Same diff. Yeah, Kant distinguished between aesthetic beauty and this sort of more profound feeling of the sublime. Mm. What well, you're talking about, especially when it comes to like Gothic cathedrals, the sort of you know, the vaults that reach towards heaven, the sort of the, the engineering marvels that they were able to create with flying buttresses and, you know, building things that were taller than had hitherto been possible in Europe. Um, that's a kind of, you know, reach for the sublime. Some of the early skyscrapers and certainly some of the monumental architecture um, of the Soviets under Stalin tried to reproduce this feeling. I mean, I think personally, at least, I mean, I know that it's, it's, considered dreary by most, but the sort of modernism and even like the sort of bloody-minded brutalism uh, that was really the, the last gasp of utopian yearning within the architectural avant-garde, it creates a feeling for me of, you know, sort of being so puny by comparison with it or it's the sort of raw concrete just, you know, you know looming over us and potentially crushing us. Mm. Um, there's a sublimity to that um, that... I find inspiring. Most people consider it, you know, terrifying, but I think that's one of its uh, best qualities. I think that people should only live in buildings that they fear. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's the communist version of a Gothic cathedral then, like the sense that you are submitting to a collective or something much larger than yourself. I think submitting might be a too strong term. Not submitting, but, but you are just oneself. one part of it, you know? Yeah. There's a religion of humanity, the positivists in the 19th century, August Comte. There are even cathedrals to humanity in Brazil that, you know, come out of the positivist tradition. And with Feuerbach and others who saw theology as a kind of alienated anthropology, which in which humanity divested itself of all of its qualities and projected them onto this sort of godhead, you know, all of its aspects and perfection. Um, there were some Bolsheviks who even believed that um, the real process of building communism was so as to deify humanity mm. and actually become the sort of god that you know had been only written about mythologically um, in all the great religious texts of the past i'm down with that so i mean as far as uh not aesthetically but in terms of just sheer absurdity and you know 
something that reflects the political, you know, state of the present. Uh, an example of doom that I would maybe bring up is uh, one of these uh, neo Nazis who's infiltrated the uh, the furry community. <laughs> this guy, uh, Magnus Deridian. As if furries Great were name. not terrifying <laughs> enough already. Magnus Deridian, wonderful name. I'm guessing that's not his birth name, but he <laughs> was arrested. He had eccentric parents. They they tried to orchestrate some sort of beer hall putsch at the Midwest <laughs> Fur Fest. Oh my god! Um, oh, that's so doom. <laughs> and. Yeah, I mean, it was tearing the fur community apart. <laughs> and um, Think of the furries. Yeah, I also saw some uh, book cover modified uh, Julius Evola's Ride the Tiger with uh, sort of uh, a, uh, a very uh, Tom of Finland style uh, <laughs> uh, tiger on the oh front of God. it. Doom sort of captures a broader zeitgeist. I mean, I'm glad that people have sort of caught on to it. There are other vaguely related uh, memes that have circulated on left book um, yacht communism this sort of i guess it was intended as a revolt against the kind of asceticism of uh of leftist activists the one the crust punks and the dumpster divers who thought that to be a revolutionary one had to not shower or or not or to, ever have any fun right yeah and just, not to not to mention too this old um you know, 70s idea of like industrialization where some college kid is going to drop out and the SWP is going to put a flat cap and some overalls on him and send him into the factory to like proselytize to the working class. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. They thought that, you know, to be authentic and working class, you have to be poor and never have a fun time as if that's actually what working people do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, working people have the most fun yeah. under the hardest circumstances. Work hard, play hard. I mean, I just... I mean, it's possible I'm just trying to make myself feel better about being broke, but like, <laughs> I feel like when Wyatt Coke is wearing his Coke shirt, just blowing fat rails on a yacht with people he's paying to hang out with him, he's not actually having that much fun. Well, the idea of empty, yacht communism is that everybody measure. has a yacht. And everybody has Coke. There's a, there's a yacht in every... Rent a friend. Like, <laughs> I would do... Like, if I would be so much better at being rich than he is. Like, it's not even funny. <laughs> I, if you gave me that I much money... That. The amount of fun that I would have is like probably a million times as much genuine enjoyment as he's currently having. Uh, doesn't yacht communism, it, it really has a, it's kind of an ironic playoff of uh, fully automated luxury communism or fully automated. We came before them. There's also oh, yacht rock. Oh, I don't know about that. Pre existing strain in popular culture. So yacht communism was the predecessor of fully automated luxury gay space communism? Yeah, well, I mean, Good job. I think it came a couple <laughs> years after. I mean, we were posting mainly like these gifted um, AK-47s that were gold plated to like some Chinese general. We were posting golden toilets with Lenin saying that, you know, what what use will gold be, you know, in a communist society? You know, maybe we'll make our our lavatories out of them. And then it actually happens. Of course. Yeah. It was doom sort of way under. Yes. Yeah, so in a way that was not emancipatory <laughs> right. at all, as so often happens. Well, I think that um, we've certainly... Wait, I have one more question. Um, the kind of drab slash beautiful Soviet architecture that we were just talking about, uh, I feel like has come into vogue in a very different context. And that is like a lot of the condo buildings you see or just high-priced rentals are basically glass and concrete boxes mm -hmm. for rich people to live in with no curtains on the windows, by the way. And These almost look do not put curtains on the windows. Like they're almost the same. Yeah, and it reminds me of how, like, you see this in a lot of different ways. Like, capitalists frequently sort of think that they've invented something that is just a pre-existing socialist idea, like these communal living spaces now that people pay like $1,000 a month to live in. We work, have, we live. You have your own room, <laughs> but like everything else is communal and it's sort of communist, but fancy and also like a maid cleans your room for you. Or like Not communist. the different <laughs> ways that they're like trying to in pretend they invented public transit and that that's like disrupting something. Like what do you make of all that? Well, I mean, that's one of the sad realities of, you know, post-war Europe and the United States that, the original sort of emancipatory vision that sort of, you know, undergirded the, the modernist aesthetic, these, these very, you know, jarring geometric forms and very, uh, you know, rough hewn materials um, was sort of divested of its, of, of its sort of socialist content and just turned into the, the, the background for, you know, enlightened capitalism, uh, the sort of high, 
you know, the high priced, high modernist, uh, very much, you know, the Mad Men aesthetic. Um, it's one of the sad ironies of history that the guy who uh, designed the uh, Karl Leibnacht and uh, Rosa Luxemburg memorial in Germany, Mies van der Rohe, eventually ended up building, you know, the sort of temple of high capitalist, you know, Manhattanism, uh, the Seagram building, mm. just 30 years later. So, and that's what happened. Oh, here's another example of that that I think is funny. Uh, this uh, enterprising tech entrepreneur uh, from Lyft, you Ugh. know about Lyft, um, is, it's called Lyft Shuttle. Is the exciting new feature for people who don't want to pay the full price for a taxi or a ride share or a reduced rate ride like Uberpool. It's a shuttle service operating only in San Francisco right now, which users can book through their app, but only stops at pre-designated points <laughs> along a set route. <laughs> it's like, no, that is literally just a bus. You invented the bus. It's like a ritzier MTA. Way to disrupt <laughs> shit, guys. Maybe it's a bit more reliable. But <laughs> but perhaps it is, yeah. Let's actually use that as a segue to uh, something that capitalism has not yet been able to uh, recuperate uh, at all, which is communist theory, actual mm. communist theory. On that note, um, where would you place yourself on the political spectrum, Ross? Would you say you're an anti-authoritarian communist? I don't really... Or a libertarian communist? The libcom versus authcom is, is an unfortunate distinction. Um, I agree with Engels, who wrote that revolutions are the most authoritarian things imaginable. It's the suppression by force of one's enemies. Yeah, um, fair enough. That said, I do think that, you know, as Marx and Engels wrote... Or I guess I should say um, you're not a statist. Maybe that's the better distinction to make. I'm trying to figure out the difference between left comms and other comms still. That's fair. And it's a common mistake. I mean, in fact, I was thinking of uh, this, this, I think it's the first episode of King of the Hill where, <laughs> where Hank and his buddies are, you know, trying to figure out where this guy Khan, who just moved in across the street, you know, where he's from. He's clearly East Asian. And so, you know, they come up to him and they ask, you know, so are you Japanese or Chinese? Because, you know, in their ignorance, those are the only two Asian countries that they know of. I often feel like that's what's being asked when people ask, you know, so are you a Trotskyist or a Maoist? Um, and then, of course, I tried to explain, you know, what left communism is, where it came from, how it's situated vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, Trotskyism, Maoism, Leninism. And just like Khan tried to explain, oh, I'm Laotian, <laughs> you know, there's just a sort of blank stare at the end of it where they repeat the question, so are you Japanese or Chinese? Um, it's difficult. I mean, people often mistake, you know, left communism for anarchism. And some of the more, you know, council communist variants do verge on anarchism in certain respects. Um, yeah, what's the difference? So the Dutch and German current... Um, led by, you know, Anton Panikok and Paul Maddock, who started out in Germany, eventually came... Friend of the show. Yeah. Or his son, anyway. Who eventually came to the United States. Um, they really fastened on to the organizational form of the Soviet, which just means uh, council. Um, so the workers' council was, to them, the embodiment of workers' power. And the way to, you know, overthrow capitalism was to divest power from you know, bourgeois parliaments and invest that power into workers' councils. Um, for them, the party was of secondary importance. And after 1930 or so, the the Communist Party element of it sort of recedes into the background and people sometimes uh, disparagingly refer to it as councilism because there is no party even involved in it. Um, by contrast... Um, that sounds pretty uh, anarcho-syndicalist. People get so worked up about this anarchist versus uh, communist thing, uh, this uh, workplace versus party thing, right? And the way I try to square that circle is, is that anarchism has, when it was connected to the workers' movement, was this deeply moral uh, movement, right, that said we don't like hierarchy, we don't like domination, right? We're morally revolted, you know, by this entire situation. And we're going to focus ourselves directly and democratically on the workplace, which if you're going to get rid of capitalism, 
and create a post-capitalist world, right? You have to deal with the relations of power within the workplace. But as we saw in Spain in 1936 and 37, 38, 39, they did that to their own detriment because when it came to actually destroying the state, when the anarchists had the ability to destroy the state, they thought the state didn't even matter. So they mm -hmm. let the republic survive, right? And then again, to flip it the other way, you have these tendencies within the workers' movement that were very much focused on the, the political aspects of things uh, and, and also you know, saw the workplace as important but sort of ancillary to things. So I, I see things historically, and this changes through time, right, and goes back and forth, but these different tendencies, instead of seeing them as competing ideologies that exist in some sort of platonic you know, ideal out there, right? What you're seeing are real reflections of the material realities of people trying to confront capitalism, trying to confront exploitation and domination, right? And moving in these kind of different, but also sort of uh, conjoined directions. Almost it, like a dialectic? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, did I, I said the B word, right? I said Bordiga. Were you going to go yeah, there? Yeah, I was going to maybe... Gonna go there, yeah? I was going to maybe uh, take it back to another B word, Bakunin, Ooh, okay. and say that basically the anarchist Marxist split was within a sort of unified working movement, international in its scope. You know, there were very serious disagreements between Marx and Bakunin and uh, their allies over how capitalism was to be overthrown, whether what the role of the state in that would be, if if any. And there was a real divergence, I mean, after Marx sort of won out within that struggle in the First International. That was when he stole all of uh, Bakunin's Hegel books, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, surreptitiously, without, uh, without Bakunin knowing. Um, Bakunin had lent them to his friend Kugelman, who <laughs> then were... were Fucking Kugelman! Or then, Kugelman's you know... good. I'm just giving my books away. Yeah, loaned permanently to, <laughs> to Marx. But um, the Second International was formed. They sort of kept the anarchists out of it from the get-go. Um, revolutionary syndicalism was still, you know, a big thing. They organized sort of concurrently, you know, without as much of a sort of party presence. But what happened really with the Second International was that it presided over a period of calm within Western capitalist society and became adapted to these sort of parliamentary procedures of sort of I mean, what might be today disparagingly referred to as respectability politics, um, sort of elected representatives and, you know, sort of spokespeople of the masses um, and sort of lost sight of the sort of revolutionary end goal. And in fact, you know, Bernstein, who was the sort of uh, main avatar, another B here of the um, of, uh, revisionism, the rejection of revolutionary uh, overthrow, said that the end doesn't matter. All that matters is the movement or the means you know, mm. towards that end. And this horizon uh, was not nearly as uh, clear or as radical as uh, people behind him uh, and many people after him because um, he thought that essentially uh, democracy could win the day, right? Is that, uh, yeah, and I mean, it, it wasn't that implausible either at the, at the time. And I, again, well, like, I want to bring it back. I appreciate that comment, actually, because you're historically grounding things again, right? So Bernstein isn't... We it's might say he's job. wrong, right? But he was looking at he was looking at the conditions that existed in that day and elaborating on them, and he came to a certain conclusion that's historically valid, but just ended up being historically wrong. <laughs> anyway, I mean, so. even though he was defeated theoretically, I feel like Bernsteinism sort of carried the day practically, and you know these sort of revisionist, reformist, you know, strategies you know, ended up being the sort of main focus of international Marxism. Uh, when the storms of history sort of were visited again upon, you know, the countries of Europe uh, and around the world, you know, there was a hardened core of revolutionaries within most of the nations who, you know, were minorities within their own parties, but who were determined to sort of transform, you know, the civil, transform the world war into civil war. And at that point, a lot of the anarchists, you know, migrated back. You, you get the Victor Serges of the world. Big ups uh, to Victor Serge, friend of the show. And uh, uh, Malatesta and others who... Badhead, that's my boy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I mean, Anton Panikok and... Uh, Pancake man, hell yeah. Yeah, Grandpa Pancakes. <laughs> um, you know, they were, you know, orthodox Marxists in a certain respect, but you know, skeptical of the centrality of the party. On the opposite end of the spectrum in Italy, there was what 
many have described as a kind of hyper Leninist uh, variant. King bitch, that B word. Yeah, Amadeo Bordiga, Boom. who basically his contention was that armchairs. Everyone needs armchairs, right? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's how he's often represented today. <laughs> but he, I mean, he basically rejected the idea of a united front with social democratic parties who had betrayed workers' revolution. He. Um, for a time was abstentionist in the sense that he was against participating in elections. He wanted to seize power rather than seize the factory, which is this, the famous you know, disjunction that he posed. Um, at least personally, I think that Bordigism uh, in Italy was closer to Orthodox Trotskyism than it was to council communism, uh, the Dutch-German variant. But there were certain shared... Um, uh, there was certain common ground between them. And after the war, when, you know, a lot of the uh, revolutionary hopes of the Trotskyists were dashed, there was an attempt to sort of synthesize, you know, the Bordigist currents and the council communist currents into a sort of, uh, you know, unified doctrine. Are you talking like uh, socialism or Barbary, that group, and... Uh Maybe not Johnson Forrest. They were more kind of post-trots, but there were tons of groups. Uh, Jill Dove, right, yeah. is one of them. Uh, Troplan, uh, these groups coming out of uh, 68 that, um, like, I think we're trying to do right now, and I think, like, hopefully a lot more people will do, uh, trying to go back and sort of resurrect, um, not just resurrect, but, um, you know, redirect and uh, re-theorize uh, conceptions that have been lost to history in a lot of senses, right? Never gained state power, never, you know, had the ability to actually, uh, you know, uh, reach out or implement any sort of uh, program, right? Yeah, so a lot of these different, you know, these minoritarian communisms, the communisms that were overshadowed by the official communist parties and even by their, their Trotskyist opposition, I mean, I hesitate to dismiss Trotskyism as a whole as just the loyal opposition to Stalinism, but in a certain Maddox, sense, uh, Maddox position. In a certain sense, it was wed to the. In a uh, certain sense. <laughs> wed to the fate of the uh, Soviet Union, and you know, really obsessed over the question of what the character, the class character of the USSR was. You know, was it degenerated worker state? Was state it state capitalism, non mode uh, of production? Yeah, the yeah. bureaucratic collectivism, et cetera, et cetera. Gilles Deve, he tried to sort of, you know, reinvestigate these strands of communism, which hadn't been entirely lost, but had at least, you know, to a certain extent been uh, eclipsed by the, the the bigger, you know, official communist movements, the Maoist uh, grouplets that uh, sprouted up across Europe and the various Trotskyist uh, sects that, you know, had taken hold. Um, and so he investigated the writings of Anton Penacook and Amadeo Bordiga, and he sort of drew them together in a post-68 sort of critical amalgam that, you know, fused with some elements of situationism, which was a very French avant-garde aesthetic and political school centered around Guy Debord. At the same time, there were various groupets like uh, the International Communist Current and International Communist Tendency, part of the left communist alphabet soup of Marxism that they sort of tried to articulate their critique of the monolithic Bordigist party and what they called the councilist epigons of, you know, Maddock and the successors to Panacook and have tried to sort of articulate a, a synthesis in that way. Um, so I guess I was just a little confused uh, to go back a little bit because um, as I understand it in Marxism, the state is supposed to sort of wither away and he's not that specific about uh, how, we're, how we are meant to structure society after that. And uh, I've been reading, I've been reading some Kropotkin. I initially got into this stuff in the first place by reading The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, which is sort of this anarcho-syndicalist planet. And I guess I'm trying to tease out the differences between um, what I might think of as anarchism, which still has like some sort of minimal administrative state and something more structured and small d democratic like what you're talking about so which kropotkin is it the bread book yeah have you been bread pilled i mean <laughs> I, I don't know if i would go that far but uh it's, it's pretty good i fuck with it yeah so do you have a critique 
I sense a critique coming on. I mean, I more and I I would say that the communist left historically um, took state and revolution as its kind of benchmark. Um, sort of that's Lenin. The idea of smashing the state, not just laying hold of the pre-existing, you know, bureaucratic apparatus, but sort of you know jarring it and replacing it with new organs of power, workers' councils, a sort of uh, militant vanguard party, um, depending on the variant. And eventually the state would be wielded as a, you know, an instrument of class domination, as it had been under bourgeois society, only the difference would be that it would be the proletariat suppressing the bourgeoisie rather than the other way around. The idea was that once this sort of class contradiction within society um, was suppressed and you know, gradually faded, then the necessity of a sort of, you know, state which has a repressive role regardless would um, wither away of its own accord. So it would, it would devolve upon sort of automatic functions of just administration and, um, you know, making sure that the various needs of society are coordinated. And it would cease to have this sort of police, you know, repressive function. Uh, even law as such, you know, legislation would no longer properly exist. See, maybe this is my, uh, God, uh, 12 or 13 year hangover from uh, anarchism talking. But when we talk um, left communism, um, I, I have to say, uh, and I think I've told you this before, Ross, that I am, I'm really not convinced on the party question. Um, when I... Um, imagine um, uh, some sort of uprising, some sort of transition. I imagine the liberatory potential of um, something like workers' councils, uh, you know, community Soviets, uh, whatever you want to call them, um, something that um, does not uh, derive from a... Um, that, that is influenced perhaps by a vanguard, right? Influenced perhaps by a... Um, a group uh, of organized actors that can help to coordinate between different nodes of activity, right? And ultimately use that, as you said, to suppress uh, any sort of um, counter-revolution, right? But um, I don't know. A lot of it is just my allergy to, um, to, to Leninism, de facto Leninism, right? Not the Lenin of state and revolution, right? But the Lenin of... Left-wing communism. Yes, exactly. And so... You know, I that's a stumbling block that I have, I have not been able to get over. Uh, and uh, it's because, um, you know, if I had my choice, you know, I'd rather live uh, exploited and dominated and, you know, be able to go to, you know, go upstate a couple times a year and maybe fly to Mexico once in a while under neoliberal capitalism um, than, you know, suffer in a gulag because I didn't have the correct views. I don't think anybody would blame you for that. Um, I do think that, should a revolutionary situation develop that something like a party would eventually coalesce of its own momentum, I think. Again, like, the party isn't something, this thing that stands outside of the class. Even the metaphor of a vanguard or an avant-garde, as it's called, is a, I mean, it's a military metaphor. It means just the front lines. Mm. Like, it's the, most, it's the most advanced section of, you know, the workers' consciousness. And it's not, you know... It's not solely composed of workers, of course, but it's a sort of organic outgrowth of, you know, workers' militancy. And what that signals to me is a kind of, you know, when it's not just the sort of uh, like hardened core of people who are sort of clinging to this uh, idea of revolutionary succession, sort of tracing their roots back you know, organizationally to, you know, their, their own theoretical bloodlines back to Lenin. Democratic centralism. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, bar ban the factions. Yeah, so... I mean, I don't think that. I don't think that there's a way around some sort of self-organization like a party, um, but once it evolves to a point of being separate from it and sort of, you know, existing over and above, you know, the workers' movement, then it falls into the danger of becoming a dictatorship of the party rather than a workers' dictatorship. As far as the applicability of any of this bullshit to the present. I mean, I've got to say that I'm not optimistic. Me neither. I mean, if you look at the actually existing workers' movement, there really isn't much of a movement at all. What you see are, I mean, spontaneous flashes of activity 
you know, violent fits and starts. But they're usually a flash in the pan. I mean, they, there's never anything that's more cohesive or enduring that is constituted. Um, and oh. I mean, looking back, you know, 100 years ago, Rosa Luxemburg posing that famous question, socialism or barbarism, I think we have to take her at, it, at her word. Like, I mean, at that point, she was saying either we achieve socialism or society as a whole descends into barbarism. And, it, you know, if she was right, then since socialist revolution did not come to pass and since or at least was stopped short, was confined to Russia, that it it follows that we've been living under barbarism ever since. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we're years. there now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. years of barbarism. I mean, it shit. could always get worse, certainly. Just to add to your pessimism, you know, 100 years ago, there was one giant looming threat of doom that did not exist, and that was the climate crisis. And we all know that capitalism demands uh, infinite growth, and we all know that we have a finite planet. One of the most frightening things, I think, and also contingent on us to sort of um, to theorize and, and start uh, activating ourselves around is this idea that there, the cl that climate change is happening, that we're starting to see it right now. And capitalism is, I do not believe that it is equipped. I really do not believe that it is equipped uh, to solve this problem. Uh, I think that if we were to have this barbarism for another 20, 30, 40 years, then... Um, I'm not saying that all humans are going to be gone, but this world will not be the same place. Um, I which, mean, it contains within it the DNA of its own destruction, right? It does. And, Capitalism, and, and it's either going to be destroyed by a workers' revolution or by the fact that there are no more people on the planet. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, either Ex way, there won't be capitalism, but I know which I prefer. The cockroaches maybe can evolve. And capitalism can end in any number of, you know, undesirable ways. I mean, it can collapse of its own inertia and because conditions can no longer sustain it or it can be overcome from within by the revolutionary subject of society and of history which is the antithesis to capital which is the proletariat right. and that's really i mean that's the whole ball game for for marxism that's where it begins and ends let's actually talk about a third possibility too which brings us way back to the conbot thing right is um that Radical social change uh, has been divorced from uh, the quote unquote workers' movement, right? Uh, divorced from large segments of the uh, proletariat and the working class for so many years now that what we see resurgent in the world, uh, what we see in Nick Land, uh, what we see in a lighter sense, right, in these Jordan Petersons and certainly with these Richard Spencer types, is a resurgence of. Uh, some sort of fascism, right? Whether that looks like a return to feudalism, whether it's a sort of brutalized rentierism, you know, of, uh, you know, ruling class off in some gated community somewhere uh, with the rest of uh, humanity left to, to eke out some bare existence, uh, precarious existence, right? That is a real third possibility too, especially as the climate, you know, as if, cli if the climate, if, we were not to solve the climate crisis, right? And there were less and less habitable parts of the world in which, you know, people could live a good life. Um, that shitty Elysium movie kind of becomes yeah. more and more plausible. Oh, my God. <laughs> Speaking of fights, um, that's another place where uh, this was actually my fault. But uh, Sean almost had to fight someone in the theater because my friend and I were talking. We were not even being that loud. And it is a very dumb movie. It was Matt Damon that did it. It was really about Matt Damon trying to ruin <laughs> Jodie Foster's beautiful lesbian planet, as our friend Ahmad <laughs> said. But anyway. And you left out the, the, the fourth option, nuclear holocaust. Passades. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's always an option. Mm. Well, I, I don't like to think about that option. The Intergalactic Workers League for the uh, Sixth some International is working on that. Well, yeah, some would say that that's actually the condition for a workers' revolution, but... Um, Listen, I don't share that view. We're going to have a full episode on uh, Posadas oh, yeah, okay. uh, in the future. Don't worry. So we're going to talk about the fourth option. Okay. So, I mean, we're going to break through the fourth wall. As far as the divorce of, you know, these radical ideas from a real substantial social base. I mean, there are various theories that have circulated about why that is the case. I mean, theory communist and end notes have um, tried to theorize it as a kind of, different cycles of struggle, as they call it, uh, which correlate to, you know, periods of capitalist growth that they that are called, you know, the formal subsumption of, of labor under capital, which corresponds to 
uh, absolute surplus value, or what happened, according to them, in the post-war period, uh, certainly by the 1970s, which is the real subsumption of labor under under capital, which is sort of technology-driven relative surplus value. Um, and the sort of purchasing power of the workers' movement being able to leverage demands against you know the state, against the bosses, um, has diminished over time, and thus for structural reasons, the worker the workers' movement is no longer able to sort of exert the kind of pressure that it once did upon capitalism and upon, you know, the bourgeois state. Others, um, groups like uh, the Platypus Affiliated Society, which I was once involved in, um, have formulated a theory of uh, the decline of the left in the 20th century, which is uh, sort of a political correlate to Endnotes' his whole, you know, balance sheet of the 20th century. Um, they look at it more through the lens of political regression and uh, borrowing a phrase from Russell Jacoby uh, of a dialectic of defeat and sort of a loss of this sort of original emancipatory vision. Regardless, I mean, I think we're in a pretty miserable state and one is one can only be consoled by looking at history to say that things weren't always this bad, you know, and might not always be this bad. Also, we have never reached the end of history before, so why would that happen now? <laughs> exactly. You know, like things aren't going to stay this way forever. In fact, I would say things are incredibly unstable and are going to move in one direction or another. I mean, ultimately, the the solace that I get, um, you know, beyond the solace that uh, we're all just specks of dust in this large universe and our lives are important for a little while and then we go bye-bye and nothing really means anything. But... Um, you know, there's that hopeful uh, concept. But the other hopeful thing is, uh, you know, I've, I've read a lot of um, the, uh, the Annal School, uh, the French school of uh, history that talks about the long Dory, which is uh, not history in terms of a human lifetime or even several generations, but history over the long term. And geographic and time. Geographic time, exactly. Uh, and I've also sort of internalized the historical materialist analysis of history. Uh, and I've read uh, enough about the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And even lately, I've been on this whole uh, fall of the, the late Bronze Age uh, empires. <laughs> uh, going to, way back. Yeah, going way back. You know, where's my 1200 BC people at? But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that um, if we make it through, and I'm not qualified to say uh, what form that's going to take, I'm certainly not super optimistic right but uh, if history shows us anything it's that as you said there is no end point to history that capitalism is a historically specific phase uh, in human civilization and also let's not forget too you know as marx uh going way back to marx uh, he would remind us is that uh capitalism does not just create its own grave digger but it also lays the basis for human liberation human freedom if only in the sense that a it creates a universal class or a class that can become uh the universal the totality of humanity by overcoming mm -hmm. its own itself as a class right but also just the basic uh material and objective conditions necessary to live a life without scarcity uh without want and if we're really optimistic without oppression and without hierarchy now, how you get there uh, is an open question, right? But if you look at the transition from feudalism to capitalism, it lasted hundreds of years with mm -hmm. many, many false starts. Go ahead. Um, I think I'm a little more optimistic than you guys. Maybe this is just me being a noob to this type of politics. But, I mean, we've seen some really inspiring left populist movements growing up around the world. Uh, in counterpoint to the scary right populist movements we've been seeing, um, you know, whether you're talking about the Bernie Sanders phenomenon in the U.S. or Jeremy Corbyn in the U.K. or Syriza in Greece, like... Um, Podemos. Yeah, like, what do you make of all that? Do you think that um, this type of social democratic reform uh, could be a step on the way to socialism? L let me... Uh I'll address this first, Ross, and then I'll pass it over to you. I um, I have kind of a different take from, um, I think, a lot of people on the, the far left who think that social democracy is this sort of um, phase that, that you need to pass through. My take on it is, um, and I'm, I'm very influenced by, uh, by Maddox Jr. on this uh, and by Goldner and others, 
uh, is that social democracy existed in a certain moment in time. The historical conditions were right in certain places of the world uh, between, let's say, the 1930s and the 1970s, right? But what social democracy requires is a rate of profit uh, sufficient uh, in order that capital would willingly, or not quite so willingly, but be forced to, and as you said, workers would have leverage to, given the conditions, right, uh, forsake a certain amount of their profits and their profitability because um, the rate of accumulation is high enough that they can still make profits and can still do very well, mm -hmm. three, four, five percent or whatever it is, while letting wages match, uh, match productivity. What I think... Or providing benefits. Yes, right. So uh, not only in the present, but of course, moving off into the future, right? Like banking on those benefits into the future. So with that said, what, the way I see social democracy nowadays is a, it's kind of weird, but um, I see it as something that's bound to happen, uh, a conception amongst a lot of people now, not just in the United States with the Bernie movement you're talking about or Corbyn in the UK or all Southern Europe, right, all over the place, right? It's bound to happen that people will look to the past for some golden age in order to return to, right? What I'm realistic about and why I think that could lead to something greater than merely social democracy is that I, I literally do not think that if you're going to have rates of accumulate, rates of profit, right, and uh, capital accumulation, you're, you're not going to have enough uh, in order to return to an era of social democracy with capitalism continuing as capitalism. If you have zero growth, right, you do not have the ability to create social democracy. So the drive towards social democracy in what I think is perhaps the very early stages of a new cycle of struggle is actually a limit and a barrier that people are going to get up against. They're going to push up against that social democratic limit it's not going to be possible to legislate. It's not going to be possible to create another class truce or class compromise, right? It's not even going to be a step on the way towards something else. It's going to become the actual barrier itself. Yeah, that's kind of what I think, too, actually. Like, we're going to get to a point and, like, you know, God bless them. I wish that they realized this now instead of, you know, maybe realizing it later. But they're going to they're going to be like, all right, we tried neoliberal capitalism. That didn't work. We tried social democracy. We tried to make a compromise with capitalism. That didn't work either. We can't go backwards. I guess we have to go forwards. I guess I am heartened to a certain extent that socialism is no longer a four-letter word. It's no longer, you know, something that, you know, people talk about only in sort of negative terms. But for those who are on the far left, who see these new populist movements, these new co coalitions being formed like Syriza or Podemos or just, you know, a spike in membership in the DSA or, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's, Corbyn's sudden ascendance to leadership in the Labor Party, I don't think that we should deceive ourselves into thinking that there's some, you know, one weird trick to, you know, push the Democrats to the left. Or Capitalists hate this one weird trick for overthrowing their haughty power. <laughs> yeah, like, or basically committing oneself to entryism into what is essentially a Democratic entryist party, you know, being part of a communist group that then joins a DSA caucus and then... I know. gotta stick up for my comrades here for a second because most people, I'd say the balance of people in the DSA are anti-capitalists at this point in time. I was pretty surprised when I found that out myself. Mm. And like, it's called Democratic Socialists of America. I think that's sort of a relic of an earlier time. I also think it's good marketing for normies. And maybe once you join, we can tell you the real name. <laughs> Which yeah. is, I, I'm going to bring up some, uh, I'm going to brainstorm some ideas for the next meeting. Oh, yeah, so it's a uh, <laughs> luxury yacht communist. Uh, DSA is a kind of caucus. Yeah, DSA it, is a gateway drug to real communism. It is, though. At least in Brooklyn, it is. And like, it's all, hard to so say when it's like in Tulsa. But... I feel like, I mean, even Sean had this view of it before I told him about it, which is there's this idea that the DSA only focuses on electoral politics, and that's just not true. That's one of like 10 plus working groups. That's like 10% of what we do. So if you're not into electoral politics, you don't have to play. There's also like, I'm not in the electoral politics working group, but I am in the socialist feminist working group, which is currently working on a uh, push for Medicare for all. Um, I'm also in the tenant organize the housing working group. Although I haven't gotten to any meetings, I read all the emails and the current 
organizing drive in our branch right now is tenant organizing in our own communities. So there are a lot of other things that the DSA mm -hmm. does that are not like, oh, we're going to pr support progressive Democrats, which is like a fine project. I'm not against it. I just think that we should be you doing should be. many, many, many other things. Too. It's sort of like, it's sort of a more is more approach at this uh, point in time, right? Well, it's a big tent. Everyone's getting along. Mm. At some point in time, we might have to talk about that. But for now, it seems like it's working. My only concern, as far as like the far left, the communists, the sort of convinced revolutionary Marxists, in terms of how they orient themselves towards the DSA, is that I'd be hoping for a migration of DSA members, democratic socialists, whatever, to the left, to revolutionary communism rather than a movement in the other direction which is revolutionary communists sort of deciding oh hey let's meet people where they're at i hate that slogan <laughs> <Yeah>. um <laughs> and let's like cynically join with this you know organization that we know isn't what we want and try to just like you know become a pressure group within a pressure group that's the wrong direction that uh, that's fair i you know i i agree with you with that the the you know, a rightward entryist move into the DSA uh, seems like a tactical mistake. But well, if there's I don't, what, I don't uh, even know on. if it's if entryist though, uh, if because the, if the majority of the organization wants to overthrow capitalism, how is that entryist? Well, I mean, what does that even mean though? Like, because well, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Exactly, and and that was my point is that there's what thirty thousand DSA members now, Something more, like more forty thousand, let's say. There's probably that many, you know revolutionary communists out there too right but they don't have an umbrella right they don't mm -hmm. have something that they can all stand together and fight under so again you know this is why i don't discount uh dsa activities because you know the the small amount of people on the you know revolutionary communist left uh, that exists in the country it's not like they're doing that great work right now mm -hmm. right um they're not uh, maybe maybe they're working in their communities. I don't know. Maybe they're putting out podcasts in Tampa, Florida. I don't know what maybe they're doing. Maybe they're just <laughs> making shitty posts on Facebook. Maybe they're just shit posting on Facebook about Stalin's red love. I mean, we don't we don't know what it is, but that's praxis. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, a, cer a certain type of praxis. Um, but no, I, I guess I'm just I'm at this point in time uh, in my development where I'm not out street fighting with cops. I'm not getting thrown in jail all the time. Where I've got like Thank a nice, <laughs> I got a nice cushy union job. Well, not so cushy, but it's a union job. Where I think that, um, given the circumstances, given that, and I take your point well that you know uh, we do live in barbarism right now. Mm -hmm. Given all of that, I stake my position out on the far left. I think that we, in the from the whole spectrum, from democratic socialists, social democrats all the way the fuck out, you know, I'll even in include my old anarchist comrades in that. Mm, I think it's contingent upon everybody to throw whatever the fuck they can against the wall right now because we're in a spot right now where our back is against it. Our back is mm -hmm. against that wall. And as comrade Stalin once said, four walls is three too many for us, right? We're going <laughs> to get the fucking wall. <laughs> so let's fight. Let's organize. I don't know how we're going to win. I'm not convinced that we're going to win. But goddamn, let's fucking fight. I mean, the most of the work is political, as I understand it, even if you have lots of guns and the agreement of a whole lot of revolutionaries. Well, you need the people with the most guns, which is the cops and the military, to not shoot you first. That's really important. Or people from the military to turn their guns on exactly. the commanding officers, yeah. which yeah. is not unprecedented at all. And no, people it's who... And it's, and every that, successful revolution in history has involved massive mutinies and defections. It uh, would have to. Tough with the all-volunteer army, though. What about the idea of the general strike? Because that is, that's the relation that we're going after, right? The basic relation between workers and capital. And, and without workers, they can't function. And the that's two things a very nonviolent way of doing it. Um, I mean, until, you know, until they come with guns and that's start killing us. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, the two things are often interlinked. So, I mean, a mass strike will self-organize. It'll pop up across you know, vital sectors of industry, paralyze, you know, production. Really, what response would the capitalist state have but to deploy its military forces, which historically is what they do. Often when, you know, a national army is instructed to or ordered to uh, fire on the citizens, you know, people who 
you know, from their neighborhood or wherever, people who you know, look like them, who speak the same language, etc. That's often when that's often the tipping point in terms of disobeying orders, you know, turning guns on commanding officers. And once that happens, really, you know, it's game over. What if we had a really quiet general strike where we all just stay home? Oh, passive man. aggressively. Hang out with the cats and drink. And watch I do that already. TV. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be better? So here's a question I'd like to end on. Once I learned that capitalism is not a sustainable system and that something's going to come after it, right? And it, can, it might be something really bad or it might be something really good. And once I realized the task before us, right, the enormity of it, I'm like, man, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Like, it's almost impossible. Would you say it's a world historical task? It's yes. <laughs> That's the ex- hardest. My thoughts kind. exactly. That's the hardest and kind of task. It's so big, and we're so far away from it. And like, how do you even deal with that on a daily basis? Can I answer this uh, before Ross does? Yeah, like I almost want to go back in time and like unlearn the things that I learned because <laughs> I was much happier before when like my friends didn't think I was crazy, you know. Except all your friends are becoming socialists. They now, are. So they're all. This is great party conversation off. material. Yeah, but like yeah. you know, most normal people think that I am crazy and that we're just insufferable loonies in our ivory tower of Marxism, like. Well, let's how do you deal with the enormity of this task on a daily basis? I'll tell you how I deal with it. Even like the cathedrals we were talking about, these sublime cathedrals that existed in the you know, Middle Ages, right? The first person that would lay the cornerstone of that cathedral, right? This very skilled uh, stonemason, right? They would never live to see that cathedral built. They'd be lucky to see five flying buttresses, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, before the time they died. It would take two or three hundred years. So at that time, you know, six, seven, eight generations for them to build that whole thing. I would be content merely to live and die uh, and uh, with the sense and the hope that, you know, humanity could move forward and that, uh, you know, at least our our progeny, you know, the generations after us could uh, uh, live a better life in a better uh, in a better world. But I still think we have to fight for what we got to. Got to fight for it nowadays. That's a beautiful sentiment. It's a shitty sentiment. I mean, <laughs> I'm being very fatalistic about everything. I mean, I'm not optimistic. But I mean, I, I guess I should probably get over my own ego, right? Because I'm mainly upset that I'm not going to get to see it because either it'll happen a long time after we die or it'll happen when we're still alive and we will die at that <laughs> point. So, yeah, I mean, you asked, you know, what my response to the enormity of this task and its seeming impossibility. Probably the most rational response to this is alcoholism. (laughs) In fact, the only rational orientation towards present political conditions is Marxism, alcoholism. (laughs) Lush communism? Are you saying lush communism? Yes. Um, But in all seriousness, I mean, this is also, I mean, it is serious. It's historical, but it... um, this was a problem communists had to sort of deal with the idea that, you know, we are struggling for something that, you know, a better world, which we might not live to see or that we might die in trying to create. And this is, I mean, in all likelihood, we're all going to die in obscurity and, you know, with very few people to remember us. Um, not me. I'm never going to die. Same. Know. Well, that's, that's <laughs> the point is, um, there was actually a faction within the Bolsheviks called the Biocosmist Immortalists. Oh, that sounds like my jam right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Leonid Krasin. Yeah, and, there needs to be a DSA caucus. And Bogdanov, they believed in the scientific resurrection yes. of past lives so that all those who toiled anonymously throughout history, you know, in the darkness of feudalism and, you know, even stretching back into prehistory could be resurrected through modern scientific methods Lenin's body could be, you know, shocked back into life like some sort of Frankenstein. <laughs> and um, we sense could sense all sense. live to, we could all live to, you know, enjoy this accomplished communism, even illiterate peasant, you know, forefathers, <laughs> foremothers. Um, wow. That's as good a Where myth as Where are they all going to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> well, also, we're going to conquer other people. planets, of course. <laughs> oh, this, okay. is where, this is where Posadism yeah. comes in. Communism will be intergalactic or it'll be nothing at all. 
But isn't like what you're talking about is kind of the inverse of the Walter Benjamin comment that like if the enemy wins, even the dead won't be. What's the quote? Uh, even the dead are not safe. That's right. Yeah. That um, what you just said did make me think uh, that this could be a positive and a negative, right? Because yes, the task before us is incredibly huge, but also we need humans need a purpose to structure their lives. Mm -hmm. And I know before I came to the politics I have now, uh, I was kind of casting about for what I should be doing. Uh, all that I knew was that I liked to write and I was good at it, but I didn't really know what I should be writing about. And as a result, I wrote about um, just the things around me, you know, the things that made my life worth living, which was mainly sex and drugs and music and oh. partying and nightlife. And... You know, I don't, I don't disavow those things now. Like, what, what else are we fighting for? Yeah, imagine how good music's going to be under communism. Yeah. Holy shit, it's going to be so how? lit. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Imagine how good drugs will be. Well, these oh are so my good. God, the best drugs. We'll, I mean, we will put our best scientists on it to find oh, yeah. the, oh, yeah. you know, the, the ideal drugs for, well, you know, maybe everyone has a different ideal drug for their brain chemistry. I mean, I think as Mark... To each according to their need. <laughs> right. You know? Exactly. And as Mark said, too, you know, like, uh, during the morning, you know, we'll go fishing. During the afternoon, we'll create new drugs. Mm -hmm. And then during the evening, we'll fucking go to EDM parties and, and test those out. Yeah. Exactly. So it breaks down that division of labor. It's just a question of you know, all Yeah. We can be the, be the drugs we want to see.